Hello, everyone, and welcome to Season 5 of Solar Punk Presents. I'm Christina. And I'm Ariel. It's Episode 5.1, and we're here to talk about what makes Solar Punk not just all about being hippie. Namely, Solar Punk's embrace of technology. Contemporary technology, but not all contemporary technology. Yeah, well, you know, because Solar Punk is pro-tech, but not blindly so. Mm. A key part of solar punk is weighing the pros and cons and seeing the advantages conferred by various types of technology, but also seeing the pitfalls of that technology or how the tech could be misused. I'll be so bold as to propose that solar punks fall along a spectrum that runs from a racially and culturally diverse and non-gender binary cottage core to the super enthusiastic proponents of the freedom perhaps represented best in Web3 and all things crypto, including, dare I say, cryptocurrency <laughs> so let's talk tech solar punks or rather let's talk solar punk tech all right let's start exploring solar punk's relationship with technology with a thought that just hit me solar punk cyberpunk and steampunk all have a central fascination with technology. But a lot of what distinguishes them from one another is not just their particular anti-capitalist stance, but in what sort of tech they're obsessed with and what they feel like can be accomplished with it. So that might be an interesting place to start talking about solar punk tech. How is solar punk's interest in tech different than cyberpunk's and steampunk's? Oh, hey, that's a really interesting angle. Um, well, let me speak to cyberpunk tech. Like, I think going off of classic genre proclivities, cyberpunk is mostly interested in the potential of technology to fuck things up, especially for the 1%. A cyberpunk world is incredibly class certified, right? So a lot of classic plots tend to revolve around a hacker who goes rogue and uses their elite skills with technology to disrupt the status quo, usually by like hacking into bank accounts and making off with tons of cash. There's also, though less talked about, cyberpunk's interest in tech as a disruptor of the human-machine boundary. So a lot of cyberpunk can be about how technology is and can be used to augment the human experience. So whether that's with razor claws implanted in your fingers or uploading your consciousness directly to a matrix and leaving your body behind. Oh, I'm thinking gardening could be interesting if I had razor claws <laughs> embedded in my <laughs> fingers. <laughs> um, but wow, okay, I think you you nailed that pretty well, Cyberpunk's uh, relationship with tech. Thank let's, you. Let's see how well I can do with Steampunk's interest in tech. So long as it's retro-futuristic and powered by steam instead of electricity, oil, or gas. Hmm. Steampunk seems to be asking... What if things took a turn before the second, more industrial, industrial revolution, and we didn't mass produce things or use internal combustion engines? What if we hadn't let tech destroy craftsmanship, quality, design, and aesthetics? What if we'd never invented plastic because we'd, we never refined oil? Mm. Steampunk seems to love to be fascinated by the whirligig aspects of machinery, but horrified by things like factories. Mm. So, okay, that wasn't very eloquent, and I am hardly a steampunk scholar, but does that sound about right? Uh, honestly, yeah, it does. Uh, like, steampunk is very into craftsmanship and showing off that craftsmanship, especially the steampunks who are into cosplay. But there's a reason that the steampunk aesthetic is so strong, I think. Tech enables steampunks to take their interest in crafts to the next level, to sort of bring out that desire for adventure that's represented in like the little model aircrafts and, and the gears. Or at least to me, that is. I'm not a steampunk scholar either, so just an interested outside observer. I think solarpunk in some aspects takes a page from steampunk's dedication to crafting with technology and using technology as a way to enhance craftsmanship. But I really think solarpunk has more of an affinity to cyberpunk's interest in how tech can be used to disrupt the status quo. But instead of for individual gain, it's for the benefit of society or an oppressed group. So to me, that seems to be the impetus behind a lot of solarpunk's interest in tech, from affordable bionic limbs for people who want them, to smart buildings that can adapt to whatever climate catastrophe comes their way in the climate change future so it can protect the humans inside of it to cryptocurrency as a way to break free from a capitalist chokehold over resources. 
smart buildings that can adapt to climate catastrophes? I feel a bit slow here. Aside from, you know, adjust the air conditioning and filter the air and maybe pull fire-resistant shutters down in case of wildfire, I'm not really up on how a building can do something to protect its inhabitants from climate catastrophes. This is where I see the whole connecting the building to the internet part of the smart moniker comes in here. The building would have access to weather data and thus be able to adjust its own internal systems accordingly in anticipation of the changes in fluctuations in air temperature, wind speed, precipitation, etc. For example, if there's a dust storm, the building could lock itself up tight with no ventilation to outside, but since it has an internal air filtration and oxygen generation system, like I've seen experiments with large tanks of algae, for example, the humans inside would still be comfortable. If unable to see out the windows for a bit. And that would be a climate catastrophe, dust storms, at least where I live now, which has probably not seen a dust storm in millions oh, yeah, and millions sure. of years. But okay, so deal with certain types of climate challenges, at least. Um, and, you know, I guess that's a that's a smarter smart home than one where the fridge orders you okra without end, because somehow yeah. the algorithm, you know how like when you, if you ever, if you ever use the shuffle when you on, on like, a media player and you know after a month it only plays the same five songs for you and ignores all the rest of them so i'm sure the same the algorithm would do the same thing for the fridges and you'd end up with I mean, nothing I, but I okra hope not i hope the technology would have come a little bit further than <laughs> that from the music shuffling type of i feel like like the same algorithm for music shuffling and grocery ordering should not <laughs> but why like, should it be a different algorithm <laughs> um, you know, I I just personally I don't like smart technology. Um, I think that you know there's too much capability for bad actors to maybe get a hold of that smart technology. I had the people who bought okra futures. <laughs> yes, those people. Those people. <laughs> I live in fear of the okra futurist hackers. So. Okay, well, you know, I'm gonna buy you a cane so you can join the fish shaking. holding a cane shaking club and all of this newfangled technology yeah I i'm on porch now i can sit on it and <laughs> get off the lawn. <laughs> okay but anyways hang on we're getting ahead of ourselves we've summarized cyberpunk's attitude toward tech and steampunk's attitude toward tech but not solar punks so i'm going to take a crack at it here and say that solar punk is interested in sustainable tech so stuff that does as little environmental damage as possible that makes people's lives easier or better in a meaningful way. So it's, it's not about tech for tech's sake, or about high-tech weaponry, or about tech that's just there to increase productivity. And it's definitely not about tech that will help the rich capitalists, authoritarians, tech bros, or corporations tighten their grip over us on power or around all the money. I agree with all of that, but it does kind of seem like we're defining solar punk tech by what it isn't and what it doesn't do. But it's a good place to start ideating. Uh, okay, maybe this is like the inner negative person in me. But <laughs> for me, what it is and what it isn't are two sides of the same coin. And, Ooh, and both tell. are... Hmm? I said, do tell. Oh, yeah, both are useful ways of getting across the spirit of the matter. Um, but if you want to talk about what it is, a lot of people talk about Solarpunk's interest in tech being about appropriate technology. Hmm. And it's easy to just say, aha, I get that without realizing that this is actually a movement that goes back until at least the 1960s and has now been largely replaced in NGO speech by terms like sustainable technology and sustainable development. But to have a solid definition of appropriate technology is helpful, so here goes. The appropriate tech movement is about going for tech that is decentralized, affordable, small-scale, environmentally sustainable, Running more on the labor-intensive side of things rather than the massively increasing the productivity per worker side of things. And it can be maintained entirely locally, okay, right? So this is really developed in terms of doing developmental work in, you know, what used to be called the third world. Appropriate technology should also make sense and serve that community meaningfully rather than providing something frivolous or, or unnecessary. There's also a little bit patronizing in that <laughs> in the charity context. Just, but... just a little bit. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a Sorry, whole... you can't have that. It's culturally inappropriate for you. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, that's a whole other kettle of fish. That That is another podcast that we 
can record at some point in the future and talk about because oh man the charity industrial complex sure sure has its problems but to me it's kind of sounding like this whole appropriate technology idea is uh related to what we like what a lot of urbanist and urban development uh, people are talking about here with the idea of getting more microgrids for electricity sort of put into neighborhoods to make them more energy resilient does that kind yeah. of sound that sounds kind of right to me, oh, right? Okay. So, yeah, I mean, so yeah, so appropriate technology should mean things like generating power locally and renewably rather than relying on huge energy companies and fossil fuel conglomerates who make big money for investors and whose extraction efforts and fuel burning is destroying the environment and driving so much climate change. But I think it also means asking if the right strategy is everyone trading their internal combustion engine powered car for an electric vehicle instead of pushing for an expanded and affordable public transportation network run on renewable energy. Mm. But it also means ride sharing, especially with people in your local community. Mm. And it means asking if sometimes maybe you shouldn't actually walk or ride your bike instead of driving or even taking public transportation. Mm. So I think we could go on like this with dozens of examples of using local craftspeople to create tools out of materials available locally, and so on, and so on, and so on. But I just want to say instead that the appropriate tech movement came about in the 1960s from ideas that had been swirling around already for a while. So it's hardly a new movement. In fact, these days, it's barely movement at all, again, with the jargon and the philosophy moving on toward ideas of sustainable development and sustainable technology which aren't as concerned about keeping things socially appropriate, local, or <laughs> labor intensive. Um, but it may be that the pendulum is swinging back towards appropriate tech, and it may be that solarpunk is one of the standard bearers in this resurgence. And, you know, maybe we need to interview someone who is involved in the movement and get them to tell us more about it. That sounds like it would be a really fascinating and informative thing to do. Honestly, I'd come across the term appropriate technology before, but I haven't ever really dug into it as the name of a movement. So I think that would be enlightening both like selfishly for me, but also for our listeners, um, many of whom maybe haven't heard of this before. Yeah, no. So I'm sure we definitely have listeners who, who know way more about it than we do as well. But oh, yeah. but it is you hear the term and you just think, oh, I intuitively understand what that means. And you and and so, you you, you know, you, you don't Google it. And so you don't find out that it has a huge history behind it. So. Right. Right. Um, but to get back to what you said about solar punks or at least one wing of the solar punk party. <laughs> viewing cryptocurrencies as a way to break free from a capitalist chokehold over resources. This is one point in which solar punks vehemently disagree about a bit of tech. Mm -hmm. There's that whole Web3 wing that's crying freedom and <laughs> privacy or anonymity or whatever. And then there's the chunk of the solar punk world that is like, die scum, all that electricity. Uh huh. No crypto, no cryptocurrencies. And then there's the rest of us in the middle who are less violently skeptical. And or, maybe you know, because we just don't actually know. Yeah, that might that might also <laughs> that might also be the case but yeah um or that we see that you know the promises are probably a little bit overblown mm -hmm. and that the downsides are probably also a little bit overblown so maybe um because as i said because we see yeah the environmental problems with cryptocurrency mining all the electricity um but we also fail to see how cryptocurrencies live up to their anti-capitalist promises Mm -hmm. If they oh. can't be traced, sure, that can be good if you don't want the man to be able to trace the flow of your money, or because you don't want to pay your full share of taxes, or because you're laundering money, mm. or because you're engaged in some seriously illegal activities involving drugs, weapons, prostitution, or gambling. Uh, yeah. Or, you know, other forms of human trafficking. And so I think most of us aren't convinced that we'd like to live in an anarcho capitalist situation. Mm. which is kind of where un untraceable, truly untraceable cryptocurrencies would steer us. Mm. But I also think that, you know, duh, blockchain, they're inherently traceable, given the information they save and that their flow is visible. And there have, for instance, been researchers who have used various simple, not terribly high-tech techniques to de-anonymize Bitcoin, as in identify real-life users behind specific transactions, 
And, you know, I've been reading about how law enforcement has already used these techniques to nail some major drug dealers and money launderers. Okay, not all cryptocurrencies are Bitcoin, but still. So I think this is one of the more particularly hot potato examples of how solarpunk isn't blindly pro-tech, but realizes that adopting and advocating for tech comes with a responsibility to ask a lot of questions about it. It sure does. I mean, I I I read some of those papers um, about those researchers de-anonymizing Bitcoin, and I agree. That's I mean, such a hot potato as you say, since a lot of technology can be seen as tools that really depend on the moral pl- moral proclivities of the people <laughs> who use them <laughs> or the people who code them. Uh, so, what kind of questions do you have in mind that solar punk should ask about technology? Should is always the word that's so easy to use. Um, But I think it's more like what questions I think solar punks would ask about technology. Uh, Yeah. Um, So in general, I think solar punks would be interested in questions that revolve around, is this particular tech worth it? Hmm. Or are the environmental costs too high? Or is the potential for social bad or authoritarian abuse too high? Does it bring out something terrible in us as groups or individuals? Or is it just simply something that just isn't going to make our lives better? That being said, I think there's still a lot of solar punks on Twitter. But anyways. So I think this is why solar punk is split about things like AI. So Mm. on the one hand, algorithms, when trained properly, can be really powerful tools for sifting through data to find patterns and make predictions. Mm -hmm. AI is critical for things like image processing helping with everything from improving your photos to removing noise from audio to counting plankton samples uh, to keep track of aquatic biodiversity to identifying cancer in medical samples or images and so on and so on. But it can also be used to discriminate against people by, say, predicting that they belong to a group of people in society most likely to engage in, say, theft Mm. um, and then proactively banning them from shops or banks or whatever. Very, can, very um, minority report. Yeah, yeah. It's it kind of, yeah. yeah. I was, yeah, exactly. Only it's less humans in the minority report, right? Mm, yeah, that's fair. And it can be used to create so-called art or music by regurgitating patterns derived from the creative work of human beings who, mm-hmm. you know, aren't paid for that. <laughs> And then have their jobs taken away from them, right? So, and, you know, and some solar punks take this ball and run with it, creating scene after scene after scene of a future with with a generic solar punk aesthetic or imagery that features people of color in roles and places where they've generally been excluded from our imaginary. So that's great. But others are horrified and indignant about the use of AI in the creation of quote unquote creative works, seeing it as little better than theft. Yeah, it's a really contentious itch issue, definitely. And we could talk about getting excited about electric vehicles run on renewably generated electricity, or we could talk about expanding the public transportation network or riding our bikes. Mm. Um, because there are definitely solar punks who hate the idea of switching over to electric vehicles because they don't think it changes anything even though it would definitely lower our carbon footprint and would definitely get rid of a lot of the particulate pollution that kills tens of thousands of people a year in Europe, for example, out of the air. I mean, I see their point, though, and maybe I do fall on that side because I think that EVs do nothing to change North America, in particular, is car centrism, which has not only led to the sprawling cities where people are required to drive in order to get to where they want to go, but a lot of environmental damage that's not just from that air pollution, but from the paving over of habitat, farmland, endangered species, homes, etc. I wanted to say um, specifically just about my, uh, about sort of locationally, uh, there's sort of a huge political issue of mining for the materials that are needed to make electric vehicles here. So that's another sort of reason that EVs are so contentious, um, not only with solar punks, but just with regular citizens of Ontario um, because the mineral deposits in northern Ontario are underneath indigenous territory so I should mention like historically 
in Ontario, Ontario was the manufacturing center for Canada, and there were a lot of automobile production factories. So right now, those factories have closed down, and the apparent solution to the high rate of joblessness is to reinvest in making vehicles so the provincial economy can go back to where it was in the 70s or something like that. I think that's logic. So that's kind of part of why people here have a lot of feelings regarding the manufacturing of electric vehicles, and it's kind of a mess. So a couple of thoughts. One thing is it takes a lot fewer people to make electric cars, I think. Yeah. They don't have I, as many moving parts. Yeah. So so that's already unrealistic I, expectation I, of going yeah. back to the 70s economy. But the other thing is, I hear this all the time about, oh, it's so bad, lithium mines and stuff like that. But why are we letting the oil companies off of the hook for the environmental devastation that's involved with petroleum mining and also that directly vents a lot of methane straight to the atmosphere mm -hmm. which and that's a very powerful greenhouse gas all right yeah. so so i sometimes i feel like okay yes we probably need to try to do this lithium mining in in as environmentally friendly and socially appropriate socially fair way as possible but you know let's not forget that petroleum mining is probably a hell of a lot worse yeah, I don't know. I I think that the like human rights nightmare that is the mining and refinement process of a lot of these critical minerals that are needed for like, well, just batteries in general, honestly, not even just electric vehicle batteries, but just, you know, like batteries in general or, or technology in general. Um, I think solar punks need to think a little bit more broadly about this topic, um, especially when it comes to what Gabriel Aliaga called our mineral footprint. So he's got a really thought-provoking essay in the volume Almanac for the Anthropocene that's edited by Phoebe Wagner and Bronte Christopher Wheeland, and it really made me start thinking about the actual sort of like nitty-gritty of, yeah, what is my sort of like contribution and, and participation in this system of sort of mineral extraction and trade around the world and, oh, and okay. that sort of thing so you know, there, I, I would agree that you know like we shouldn't let the fossil fuel industry off the hook at all but also we shouldn't just uncritically invest in evs and be like yes this is totally the solution to everything and it's it, there are no downsides kind of yeah. thing i think it's something you know maybe if people had been thinking critically about fossil fuels when you know we decided to go for that it would have things would have been a little bit different but Oh, no, I think when we first started using, um, well, maybe not coal, but, you know, the, the petroleum stuff, people were like, oh, oh, I could make a lot of money. Um, <laughs> I mean, like, yeah. Yeah, I think, but we also have to be careful because sometimes we're picking up the arguments from the petroleum that have been planted by the petroleum companies against mm. electric vehicles and, That's all, true. and this kind of stuff. And, but, but I just wanted to say, you know, for more than 20 years now, there have been websites where you can calculate your, you know, your environmental footprint based on uh, whether or not you have no, uh, okay, this is a little bit outmoded, but, you know, a digital camera mm -hmm. um, uh, or a smartphone. And do you have, okay, also outmoded, a media player? Uh, do you have a laptop? Do you have a computer? And, you know, do you have all these things. So it's, we're kind of picking on the electric cars and okay, the battery is big, but, you know, a lot of stuff has batteries in it now. So yeah, it's true. But I mean, like, I still think the critique stands that we need to think more broadly about um, the sort of like implications, I guess, of of battery use and, and technology. And, you know, like it just doesn't spring fully formed from the, you know, like the Canadian tire. <laughs> the solar panels don't just arrive at your doorstep, you know, like the the that material comes from somewhere. And, oh, it comes from all over the world, you know, right? What's involved in that, right? But I, I think a lot of people aren't really aware of that. So it's it's important to sort of highlight that. And yeah, we're borrowing a lot of um, like this greenwashing rhetoric from the oil industry with even talking about your, your mineral footprint, the footprint, like the carbon footprint was something that was invented to download responsibility onto the consumer for, you know, like polluting and stuff like that instead of being like okay but you know like it's actually we need to use energy to live in this society and you know turn the lights on and stuff like that so why aren't we given more options than just you know fossil fuel and these things that sort of spew methane into the atmosphere and so turning back that critical gaze onto the governments and organizations 
and companies that are not investing in these greener options and saying, hang on a second, um, we as the consumers, we cannot be empowered to make green choices unless, sadly, there are the green choices to make, you know, and there aren't currently at this point. Well, yeah, no. So I think that's an interesting point. I remember reading somewhere that, you know, if you decided to become homeless in, say, Los Angeles or, you know, somewhere in the U.S., and, you know, you no longer had a car and you no longer bought stuff and you no longer had heating or air conditioning or a refrigerator or, you know, or any of these things, you didn't use electricity, you would have still have a carbon footprint that was higher than the global average, just simply by the virtue of the fact of all of the CO2 that's generated to run the economy in the U.S. and mm. to run the streetlights and, you know, all this other kind of stuff that consumes carbon but isn't attached to its it's a single particular you know, anything a single particular person is doing individually yeah i mean like the thing is like like it or not you are part of the society that you are born in even even by rejecting that society you're still saying i was a part of that society and i am still a part of that society as part of my identity even in a negative and so that still is impacting you well, you, you don't have much choice to pick up and leave. I mean, have you ever tried to immigrate to another country? No, I have not. And you know what? I don't want to try at this point. Well, you know, so I mean, unless you... A lot uh, of paperwork. You know, well, unless you get married to someone or, you know, have a, the sort of job offer that opens those kinds mm -hmm. of doors, it's really, really hard to move from one country to another. So, so people don't have much choice about what society they belong to. I mean, no. in, a pra a very, in a very, very practical sense. Yeah. And so as solar punks, you know, you kind of have to look at that society and say, okay, this is what I have to work with. You know, I can't just, you know, like fuck off to the woods or something like that and <laughs> renounce so society <laughs> and just be like, I, I'm not part of this. This is, you know, like I washed my hands of this. You can't wash your hands of that. Um, you, but you can make it better. You can, uh, by actively participating in society and steering it in the right direction, you know, or, or well, not maybe not steering it, but nudging it, you know, like insofar as how much power you have to nudge it. That might just be, you know, like nudging like your neighbors to, you know, like plant more wildflowers or something like that uh, for the pollinators. But you're still making a positive difference in the way that things are run. Ideally, I mean, like, you could, you know, like affect policy to be better, but like not everybody has the spoons for that. And not every municipality allows their citizens to have that kind of, uh, I mean, input into how their bylaws are made, et cetera. I'm, I'm getting into the weeds here. <laughs> yeah, tech, tech, tech. We're talking tech. Right, tech. Okay. Not wildflowers, yes. tech. Okay. Yes, tech. Technology. Yes. Okay. Oh, right. We were talking about cars and the cult of the car and the sprawling awfulness that is roads. It's definitely fair to say that the cult of auto would be a good thing to kill. I mean, mm -hmm. even if I'm like, woo, electric cars, woo, because it's like I was, ex ex as I was thinking when I was stuck in traffic this summer, going back and forth between where my mom lives and out to the valley and back. Uh, just imagine cities without all the traffic and without all the parking lots. That would be so great. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you do need to drive, even in countries that have decent public transportation networks. So mm -hmm. out in the countryside where I live, there is no public transportation at all. I mean, like, I think there's a bus if I walk more than a mile from my house, but then it doesn't really go anywhere useful. So we'd be up the creek. If we didn't have a car, I wanted to say we'd be up the creek without a paddle if we didn't have a car, but that sounds kind of funny. But anyways, <laughs> um, I'm sure people managed here without them before, but at a high price sometimes. Mm. So if we look at my across the street neighbor who's lived here pretty much her whole life, she didn't get an education um, because she literally could not get to gymnasium, which she would have needed to go to in order to go on to university. Wow. Is the closest one at that time? Well, okay, I mean, right. So she she had a general, she got her general education, right? But she she couldn't go further than that. So the closest gymnasium at that time was about 20 miles away. So she worked low-level clerical jobs her whole life 
instead of, for instance, becoming a physicist, like her son was able to become. Um, and he's now a professor and a bit of a bigwig at a fusion research facility. And then the mm -hmm. sort of opportunity that was not available to her simply because of a lack of transportation. Oh, that's harsh. I have some female relatives who also did not get an education because it was just too far away. Yeah, my neighbor also talks about how the grocery store used to come to them. Huh. So twice a week, the baker came through with a, a horse-drawn cart. I think the milkman also had a horse-drawn cart. Uh, but the butcher, I think, had a, a van, maybe even a refrigerated van. And I don't know about the green grocer. And the green grocer also sold sold like mustard and stuff like that. But if you or in pickles or whatever. But if you wanted to buy any of that stuff, you had to to come bring your own container. Mm -hmm. So I mean, what a different way to live. Like a lot a lot less plastic trash, for instance. Uh huh. And even though here that persisted up through probably the late 1960s. Oh wow. You know, but it was also it's also farm country here. So people also raised their own pigs and chickens and had apple and plum trees, all sorts of berry bushes, and, and they grew potatoes and cabbages and stuff. But I mean, like, if you don't have the green thumb or the spoons for that, like growing all of that food, like, wow, that could be tough. I certainly wouldn't want to take transportation away from folks in those situations. Although I do feel compelled to point out that when I lived in Japan, I would travel through some quite often rural villages that were still serviced by a train stop. Like I got stuck out in the middle of nowhere one time because I read the map wrong. And that's a real hazard. Like, I don't know if you remember that scene in Spirited Away where Sin gets off the train after riding it through the flooded spirit world to go see, uh, I think her name's Zaniba. That's the evil Yubaba's sister. And she gets off at this wooden platform that kind of looks like it's in the middle of nowhere. Zaniba's house doesn't seem to be part of any village. There's no other signs of people living there. And that's actually a real thing, it turns out. I mean, like, not the flooding, but just the train stop in the middle of nowhere that seems completely deserted. So anyway, I think that rural communities not being served by public transport is a failure of the government for that reason, because I've seen that it's completely possible if there is political will. Like I said, if you're willing to view investment in the in the transportation ne network as an investment in your economy and in your society, yeah. as opposed to being like, well, we need to extract profit from it, so therefore we can't serve these, you know. Yeah. Anyways, but so if we as societies decide we want to have a sustainable transportation network on par with the network of roads that we now have, we could start working on it. But it'll be expensive. It'll take time, and you'll have to convince a lot of people who like to drive their cars. Mm -hmm. And I think in the short run, I hate to say it, it'll be faster to have everyone start driving electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. Because it's it takes a long time to build new train lines, for instance. And it's expensive, you know, millions or tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars per mile. Especially if you have to buy up the land first. And I think in terms of reaching net zero soon enough to avoid some truly spectacular climate catastrophes, which is to say, like, we should have done this already, um, <laughs> we can't wait to build up a transportation network to stop driving cars with internal combustion engines. Fair point. And, and I think that's true even here in Germany, which, you know, okay, the, the network is, is uh, has a lot of, what's the term, deferred maintenance or whatever, and is <laughs> yeah. wasn't yeah. invested in for a long time. Um but it's still, you know, at least a decent train network. Mm -hmm. um, but let me ask you, do you think we'll succeed in convincing the world as a whole to power down their lives a bit, start consuming sustainably, and only embracing appropriate technology, you know, appropriately? Can all the solar punk stories in the world actually convince the world to do that when a clear and present existential threat, you know, climate change and all this other stuff, hasn't been enough to convince us yet? Only the easy questions in this episode, I see. <laughs> well, you know, if you ask them first, you don't have to answer them yourself. That's my strategy. Uh, I see. Okay, I should remember that for next time. So, like, I don't think I could address her question fully because I'm, like, not omniscient and I don't have the ability to see the future. But I do believe that it is actually possible because I have experienced it myself, although not through fiction, that anecdote I just told you about the train servicing rural places in Japan is actually what made me realize that it was possible to convince at least part of the world, or certain countries and populations, that transit technology in even less populated areas is a good and beneficial thing. I imagine that 
if I encountered narratives where transit was a fact of life and just a regular but ubiquitous part of the background setting, I'd be more convinced that it was a good idea and eminently achievable. As you can see, though, from our extremely drawn-out conversation on the topic, uh, technology like electric vehicles is something that solar punks of all stripes have questions, also of all stripes, about. And working those questions about technology out in the arena of fiction is often really helpful as both a thought exercise, a form of entertainment, and a place to bring up more questions. Like, to me, all technology necessarily has good and bad parts of it. There's nothing that is wholly good or wholly evil. They just end up on different points along the spectrum. But is there technology that's beyond the pale for a solar punk to use? Like, besides the obvious development of weapons, it's worth thinking about. Hmm. What tech would I not use? I think I'm definitely not a fan of nuclear power, uh, mostly because of the safety issues and the waste issues. But, you know, I lived in France for a bunch of years and I didn't refuse to use electricity, 85% of which was pro provided by a nuclear power plant. So I think this is a tricky question because sometimes to participate in the society you live in, you don't have a lot of choice in the matter of what tech you use. Mm hmm Totally. I also refused to have internet at home, although I had it at work, until 2009. Oh. Yeah, I, you know, I was living at work. <laughs> so <laughs> what was the point of having it at home? But anyways, I also issued cell phones and then smartphone, smartphones for decades because I don't want to be available anytime, anywhere, and I, I just hate the privacy issues. Mm. I only caved in on the cell phone slash smartphone front a year ago when it briefly felt like we were going to have to keep providing our COVID-19 vaccination status if we if we want to fly anywhere or use public transportation or go to a cultural event. That reminds me of my mother's attitude in the early 2000s. So like she would refuse to get a cell phone at all because she viewed it as not a way to get in contact with other people whenever she wanted, but as a metaphorical leash that meant that other people could bother her whenever they wanted. And I still think about that a lot. Oh my god, exactly. You know, I've never thought of it as me being able to call anyone anytime I wanted. Mm. I've always thought of it the other way around. So, you know, and even now, I refuse to use the internet on my phone. Like, I've done it like three times in the year and a bit that I've owned this phone. Mm. And I definitely refuse to use the Instagram app or anything else related to Meta on my phone. I hard, In fact, I hardly ever switch the phone out of flight mode. Oh, wow. Because I don't like being tracked. I mean, not that I'm up to anything. I just, it's just the principle of it. You know, on the other hand, every time I'm back in the U.S. to try to take care of my aging relatives, it's a freaking nightmare not to have a smartphone that works in the U.S. You know, and mm -hmm. I never remember to set mine up for roaming. And so then I I, I can't turn it on because it would be too expensive. And anyway, who's, who's going to call a German phone number? Nobody. Nobody is going to. Um, so I would get rid of the damned thing since I pretty much only use it to take pictures with. Mm. Um, except now I can see pretty soon I won't be able to do anything, not even use a credit card without having a smartphone. And I, I, I do also see that my social life suffers for it because everyone expects to be able to text you or WhatsApp you. And I'm like, okay, the one app I have is Signal. Um, uh, but most people I know are like, what? Never heard of it. <laughs> I feel that. Uh, I refused to get WhatsApp until very recently when I realized that it was either get WhatsApp or lose contact with a group of friends that are dear to me and who I really want to stay in contact with. Uh, but anyways, I don't know. Just because I'm weird, does that mean other solar punks have their limits too? Are there solar punks who refuse to drive cars? And I'm sure for every solar punk who is enthused about cryptocurrency for its alleged anonymity... I'm sure there's a solar punk who refuses to have anything to do with them because of the electricity use. But like I said, it's hard to go against the grain of your society. It's like this. Everyone loves to make fun of people in the U.S. for the stupidly large, fuel-inefficient cars that they drive. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, all the SUVs and stuff like that. Um, but the minute people end up in the U.S., they start driving them. Okay, maybe not U.S. Uh, SUVs, but, you know, stupidly large, fuel-inefficient mm -hmm. cars. Because in the U.S., the quote-unquote small cars are already large and have crappy gas mileage by, say, European standards. And bus services, meh, and train service in most regions, at least in the West, is somewhere between useless and non-existent. So individuals are greatly limited by their milieu. 
I would also add that that uh, like everything you just said uh, also applies to about 95% of Canada as well. Yeah, so. it's this like rugged individualism of the of the pioneers who crossed the prairie, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> So I think Solarpunk can say sorry, but being car-centric, using AI in the creative spaces, facial recognition technology, law enforcement agencies using genealogy databases, fossil fuels, nuclear power, weapons, NFTs, cryptocurrencies, Gore-Tec fabrics, and Teflon cookware, military drones, robot dogs, petrochemical pesticides, plastics, GM foods, and all that are totally unacceptable technologies, but uh, so what? As individuals, and even as communities, we can't even refuse to participate in most of these things. They're happening anyway. Like, you can stop buying Gore-Tex, but you're still contaminated with the stuff, right? With the PFAs. With PFA standing for perfluoroalkyl substances and polyfluoroalkyl substances, both of which are types of forever chemicals, which are really, really bad for us, and which can be found or pretty much in every single living creature on Earth at this moment, thanks to the widespread production of things like Gore-Tex and nonstick pans, waterproof makeup, and, oh, you know, it's basically anything water-resistant at this point. Um, anyway, so like all these things are happening anyway, even if, we, even if we say, no, not me, I'm not supporting that financially or otherwise, everyone else is. And for all that some of us have spoken out against all of these things and done our best not to be a part of them, they've all skyrocketed anyway in the last 20 years. The more we've become environmentally conscious of these things, the greater the, the use and per capita use of this stuff over the last 20 or 30 years. So which I guess is me asking, what's the point of solar punk having a stand about reasonable, sustainable-ish tech or this appropriate tech, or whatever you want to call it, when all of this other stuff is just going to happen anyway? Well, I think that's coming dangerously close to the fallacy of thinking that because you participate in society, you're not allowed to critique it. Like most of us live in a capitalist economic system and how we profit from it, and it makes our lives easier to live. But that doesn't mean we can't call out the systemic abuses and failures of capitalism as a system. It doesn't mean that we can't unsubscribe from that system, even though other people are still fully buying into it and it's happening all around us. I would argue that that's how you make good decisions about how to properly or appropriately use a tool or to discard it. So I think that a solar punk who refuses to participate in society for those reasons can't really call themselves a solar punk at all, not gonna lie. Inherent in that punk label is countering the status quo, not just abandoning it entirely so you never have to deal with it and screw all the other people who don't have the ability, like financially, physically, or whatever, to do the same thing as you're doing are the ones who walk away from the Amalas doing literally anything to make the world better. My answer is nope. To me, it's an easy, lazy way out. Staying and fighting the good fight on behalf of the powerless who are caught up in a terrible system, though, I think that is very solar punk. Oh, I wasn't saying not participate in society. Just not participate in the aspects of technology that you don't agree with. Like refusing to drive a car, for instance and supporting public transportation by using it instead. You're kind of like uh, emptying the ocean with a spoon at that point. But anyways, but honestly, who amongst us is actually fighting for the right things in any sort of meaningful, effective way? I mean, I don't think I am. You know, I try not to buy too much stuff. I mostly try to avoid fast fashion. I eat pretty low on the food chain. Occasionally, I show up at a protest. But beyond that, I mean... But you are doing what you can with what you have, right? Um, to my mind, being a solar punk is not being lazy about thinking, and you're clearly thinking about this stuff. So having a stance about deeply considering what kinds of technology we should be using and how and which sorts we should not bother with seems like kind of a no-brainer because I would hope that anyone who seriously wants to engage with the technologies of the moment, such as all of those that you just listed above, would have read up on them and talked to their proponents in addition to their detractors, spoken with those who are affected most by these tools, considered their potential and pitfalls, and drawn conclusions from there. Or, yeah, am I being naive about that? Why, like, that sounds like a lot of work that most of us honestly aren't doing. Not at that level. That's a long list you just read out. Yeah, I mean, like, obviously you can't do that for everything all at once. Not everything everywhere all at once, as it were. Um, 
I mean, like it, it's a process, right? Like living is a process. It is a, a thing that takes time and, and thinking is a thing that takes time as well. And so like, it's not, I'm not saying that you're a bad person if you haven't taken the time to think about these things because you just do not have the time in your life right now. No, not at all. I mean, I, you know, but I think you do have time. It behooves you to think about it. I think it's important that to have curiosity about these things. Mm, yeah. And I because and and not just take things for granted. But you know, I mean, I don't think I've talked to proponents and detractors of say nuclear power. <laughs> right. Yeah, maybe that's that's more of getting to the heart of what I'm trying to sort of say, but I'm making it unnecessarily complicated. But having curiosity, you know, just staying staying what did you open do? being open and open and curious being perpetually open to the question that's apparently a, a part of feminist praxis um that i got from my feminist theory uh, and, and just being sure curious about that. being curious about how things work and yeah. and having yeah. a couple of critical thinking skills yeah, not um, like immediately encountering an idea or a technology and making your mind up about it within about like five minutes and then just never deviating from that opinion. Or just never thinking about it, right? Yeah, so, that's true. Um, so, so I think without the enthusiasm for renewable energy, electrification, hydroponics, and some day maybe fungal textiles... And for some solar punks, cryptocurrencies, we'd all just be hippies down on the commune turning over compost in the garden. Huh. Um, like, I can't even imagine solar punk without technology. Like, I feel like it's baked into the name. But honestly, what even is a technology anyway? Like, I like my glasses very much, thanks. And I tend to think pretty highly of, like, medical technology. I don't want to live without that. So... I once um, got to listen to a bunch of anthropologists and people who study the psychology of work um, get together and muse on what technology is. Hmm. And the anthropologists were like, well, a hammer is a tool, but something with gears is tech. Because hmm. the hammer is doing directly what you imagine it would do. So let you apply sudden force to like a nail or to smash someone's brains in or, you know, whatever. Right. So it's <laughs> it's straightforward. I would hope. I would hope that maybe smashing someone's brains in isn't quite as straightforward as hammering a nail. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that, yeah, anyways, but it's, <laughs> yeah. But if you turn the handle on a gear, the meaningful outcome isn't that the cogwheel turns, it's that some other work gets done, like grinding wheat into flour, or, or you know, if you're spinning the wheel on your bicycle by pumping the pedals, it's propelling you along. Right. Or, you know, the gears in the watch or keeping track of the time of day. So those mm -hmm. things are all tech. They're all that's technology. Right. Because there are steps between the action that you're taking. So, you know, winding the watch or or turning the crank or pedaling the pedals and the outcome that depends on mechanical bits of I mean, you can also call it grammar. So these little pieces that you can stick in between that change like yeah. the outcome. So it's like, yeah, okay, so you can, it's analogous to like grammar, you're inserting it into the action to create a specific outcome that doesn't really have anything logical to do with the starting action. So like, why should pushing a button launch a rocket or start a car or even ring a doorbell? So weirdly to me, glasses are not tech. They're mm. a tool that you use to bend the light so that when the light passes through the lenses in your eyes, it, it lands at the right spot on your retina to be in focus. So the glasses are doing like directly what you would expect them to do. But the machine they use to grind the lenses is tech because it probably involves pressing buttons and engaging gears. Okay, that's so fascinating. But I mean, yeah, like I enjoy the outcome of technology, I guess, in my glasses. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, like if, if, I, if we lived in a world without technology, that would also be a world where I would not have my glasses. You could grind your own lenses, but, you know, you probably wouldn't be very good at it. Could I really? Uh, I, I mean, <laughs> in principle, you could. Mm. I ha I have ground, yeah, lens. Now nah, maybe not lenses, but I have ground things like lenses. Oh. It's a, it's a, it's not fun. And you know, it's polished, polished, it's polished. Oh shit! I just scratched it. Oh, oh. Anyways, for a bit, I was sort of thinking about a group of solar punks, say, not a commune, but maybe a co-housing arrangement around a common garden, who sat down together and made decisions about technology, like the Amish do. 
Does this particular bit of tech serve us more than it would corrupt us or have a bad effect on the world? Do we let this piece of tech into our lives? To what extent do we use this piece of tech and to what extent do we shun it and for what reasons? Yeah, uh, opening up the issue of technology to those questions so it should be something that solar punks regularly do in like their groups. Like it's a communal thing, I think. It helps normalize sort of questioning the status quo and, you know, staying curious. And I was thinking that while this has had a big internal effect on the Amish communities, it hasn't actually had much of an effect on the wider world, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're not keen on electricity, hasn't stopped the rest of us. <laughs> Uh, so how could solar punk communities have not just an internal effect regarding having an appropriate relation with technology or having appropriate technology or whatever, but a much broader effect? Because the whole point of solar punk is making the whole world, or as much of it as possible, a better place. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so I was thinking maybe this is where projects like distributed production come in and the being able to connect with each other via storytelling and over the internet. So we could be a bigger, broader example of a better way to do things that way. You know, if we manage to establish, um, if, if we could start on a smaller scale, but then communicate it. So maybe that's a thing, using tech to support each other all over the world to create these spaces and communities where we have a carefully considered attitude towards technology. And, and I don't mean fearful, but I mean, maybe, maybe I mean wise, a wise attitude toward technology. Yeah, a, a healthy respect for technology and its capabilities seems pretty wise to me. Uh, modeling how to have ongoing discussions about certain technologies and their pros and cons and whether to use them seems like a very solar punk thing to do because it's in effect educating the community on how to, well, how to communicate with each other. <laughs> And how to think critically about how technology is sort of taken up and used by different groups of people around the world and its appropriateness to the situation of that particular group of solar punks. Well, and, and also, I think, share information. Because there's a lot of experts out there. And there's mm -hmm. a lot of solar punks who know a lot of, yeah, I won't say niche because that sounds terrible, but, you know, a, a, a lot of specific high-tech things about specific things. But anyway, so I think all I've managed to do in this discussion, aside from reveal what a weirdo I am, <laughs> is convince myself that solar punk tech is all about appropriate tech and figuring out what sustainable tech is and isn't appropriate for any particular community. I think it's definitely worthwhile to sit and think about these questions, though, and how they could apply to a solar punk lifestyle, in particularly your own solar punk lifestyle. Like asking the right questions is a skill and a necessary precursor to actually viable solutions, at least in my opinion. So I'm glad that we talked about this. I hope this helped our listeners also come to a place where they have some good questions about solar park technology and perhaps some answers. Like what, for example, would be appropriate technology for a solar punk community? How would a solar punk society deal with new technological innovations? I hope that we can explore some of those questions and answers in this season and beyond. And I also hope to see more insightful questions and answers about solar punk and its relationship to technology sort of out in the wild. Oh, yeah. And in stories. Yeah. 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 I would love to see more stories that sort of think about the ramifications of technology. That would be great. Or also just how solar punks approach that. Yeah. Approach dealing with that. Yeah, exactly. That would be amazing. So go right. Yes. Right now. Right now. Go right. <laughs> and that's a wrap for the first episode of Season 5. Woo! Don't forget to support us on Patreon and check out our YouTube channel and have a look at our website and all of that great stuff. Thank you for listening to Solar Punk Presents a podcast hosted and produced by Ariel Kroon and Christina De La Rocha. The audio for this episode was recorded in part on the traditional territory of the neutral Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples. And in Germany. The opening and closing music for this podcast is Water Cooler Gang by Monkey Warhol, available for use under the Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 International License. Don't forget to support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash solarpunkpresence. Every little bit helps us keep bringing you discussions and interviews. Until the next episode, keep dreaming. And stay solarpunk. <laughs>